welcome everyone to uh, the monthly NUG meeting. Uh, <coughs> uh, after the meeting, we are going to uh, socialize probably at uh, the uh, restaurant downstairs. Um, so I hope uh, all of you will join us there. Um, today we are hmm? hi. Today we are um, privileged to have one of the uh, lead developers of Linux CNC with us over from the United States of America. And he is, uh, um, was it 15 years or more than 15 years contributor to this project and a lot of other <coughs> relevant fabrication projects. And uh, he's going to uh, give a presentation about uh, free software and fabrication. The floor is yours, Sebastian. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sebastian. I'm here visiting from the US. Um, thank you, Noob, for the invitation. I'm happy to be here. Um, as Peter said, my primary project for the past 15 years has been um, Linux CNC, which is a real-time machine controller that runs primarily under Linux. Um, this is the very bottom layer of a software fabrication stack um, that begins at the top with computer-aided design. Um, the middle is made up of computer-aided manufacturing, and then at the bottom is the machine controller. So I'm going to give an overview of some options um, for each one of these layers of the stack uh, in, in free software. Uh, and I should preface this, I'm not an expert at the top two layers of the stack. I'm merely an interested amateur. Okay, so <clears throat> we divide fabrication machines roughly into two kinds, additive and subtractive. Um, I think a lot of people have seen 3D printers um, as additive machines that build a part up out of nothing by adding material where the part should be. And um, the other type, of course, is subtractive, which starts with a larger piece of raw material and removes everything that is not the part you want. Um, these machines are similar in some ways and, and different in some ways. Uh, on of these examples here, uh, one of these machines is not like the others. And um, I'm, I'm talking about this 3D printer here, which um, uses a completely different software stack that I'm not going to discuss at all. Um, it presents the entire layer of the 3D print at once as an image from um, a, a, a light projector. All the other machines, this 3D printer and the, the subtractive machines, work on a, a totally different technology, which is going to be the focus of this talk, which is G-code-based fabrication. G-code is a vector language um, that describes the motions of a controlled point. On the 3D printer, the controlled <coughs> point is the nozzle that drives around and uh, e ejects molten material to build up the part. And on the subtractive machines, the controlled point is a, um, a, a cutting tool that, um, that, that removes material out of the part. <coughs> um, the other thing to mention at this point is that G-code is um, a fairly high-level language. Uh, it is completely <coughs> independent of the kinematics of the machine. Um, I did a bad job selecting examples here. I'll, all four of these subtractive machines uh, use um, what we in Linux CNC call trivial kinematics, where each uh, axis of the machine corresponds to one axis of a Cartesian coordinate system. So very straightforward. But there are other kinds of machines like robot arms and uh, delta robots that are uh, extensively used. In those cases as well, um, the G code that is fed to the machine <coughs> is uh, using the standard rectilinear um, Cartesian coordinate system and the kinematics of the machine uh, take care of implementing the uh, more complicated uh, joint motion. So G-code is independent of machine kinematics. So the, uh, the workflow, this three-layer workflow, uh, is largely um, influenced by the process that you're using. Um, whether it's additive or subtractive, whether you're working on a mill or a lathe. Um, 
it's influenced by what kind of machine you're uh, going to produce your part on. on. Obviously, a, a lathe has totally different um, uh, kinds of commands that it will accept rather than uh, as opposed to a mill. A mill generally will be a three-axis or more machine. A lathe is a two-axis machine. Uh, but uh, despite all these differences, there are some common themes. Uh, and the commonalities uh, roughly look like this. First, you need a model of the part that you're going to produce. This will be generally a 3D model. Um, it can be a 2D model. Uh, for example, the, the laser cutter that was on a, a previous slide doesn't uh, have any notion of, of, of a third dimension. Lades, I mentioned, are two-dimensional. Uh, so this model uh, you can either get by drawing it yourself in a CAD program. Um, some common free CAD software uh, is uh, FreeCAD. Um, there is a, a similar younger project uh, called Solve Space, um, which, is, uh, um, which behaves very similarly. It's a GUI-driven uh, software where you, uh, you, you, you model the part. Um, OpenSCAD is another option. Uh, it is more programmatically driven. Uh, you write a text description of the part uh, rather than drawing it in a GUI. And of course, for 2D stuff, uh, um, you, use, you can use software like uh, Inkscape uh, to draw uh, 2D models. Um, there are a number of process-specific design constraints um, that you need to take into account when you're modeling your parts. Um, one that's, um, I, I think, familiar is uh, 3D printed parts often will need supports. Um, and uh, this has problems uh, with some kinds of geometries. We'll get into that later. And um, for subtractive, uh, fabrication processes, uh, you need to consider um, process-specific constraints like work holding, um, tool force, tool deflection, um, stuff like that. So these are things to consider when you're generating a model yourself. The other way of acquiring a model is to download one from model sharing websites like Thingiverse or GrabCAD. Um, a downside with that is that oftentimes people share STL files, uh, which technically are 3D models, but they uh, are not a format that is um, amenable to being edited. It's, uh, it's, an, it's a, uh, uh, almost more like object files com compiled from source code rather than being source code themselves. Um, there's ways around that, and we'll get into that in a bit. Okay, so once you have a 3D model in your CAD program or in STL, you would feed this to the next layer down in the stack, uh, which is the CAM layer. Uh, CAM takes the 3D model as input and under human guidance produces G-code um, in a process-specific way again uh, to realize the part. In um, additive, in, in 3D printing, um, this is done by a program called a slicer uh, that I think a lot of people have played around with. And in subtractive, um, the, um, the CAM software doesn't have a specific name. It's just called the CAM. Um, it is much less mature than slicers. I think because the technology, the, the, the machines needed here are less commonly available and much more finicky and expensive. So um, both of these CAM softwares will produce G-code um, that you would then run on the machine controller of the machine that you're using to realize the part. On 3D printers, this is often um, the, the printer firmware like Marlin or Gerbil, Gerbil, I'm not trying to say it. Um, and on subtractive machines, um, the project that I work on, Linux CNC, is used to interpret the G-code and drive the um, machine around. Once the machine is done producing the part, there is often some human uh, input needed um, to, to finalize it. The part might need post-processing in the form of removing supports uh, for additive or uh, deburring or si sanding, final polishing on subtractive parts. So that's the uh, rough overview of the stack. Uh, any questions on that yet? Or we'll jump into some examples. 
So uh, we'll start with additive because it is a lot easier than subtractive. Um, the software is more mature. Um, in this example, the part on the left is an old part from, um, from a 3D printer that I have. Uh, and the part on the right is a replacement part. I wanted to um, upgrade the hot end on my, uh, on my printer. That required upgrading the extruder, which required upgrading the X carriage, uh, mostly a mounting issue. Um, so the process that I went through, uh, my printer started life as a kit based on a fork of an open source design called uh, Mendel Max 1.5. Uh, I found the kit makers long abandoned GitHub repository, which luckily contained uh, models from many but not all of the parts in the kit. Uh, unfortunately, only in STL format. So um, <clears throat> STL, I mentioned, is not a source format. It's an uh, intermediate format for machine consumption, not human consumption. It does not describe human intent. Um, the features of the part are not modeled in a way that can be uh, modified or, uh, or directly just, uh, understood by humans. But uh, it's very popular um, anyway. Uh, so I uh, downloaded the STL file from GitHub, imported it into FreeCAD, and uh, used it as a, um, a, a reference. I took measurements from the STL file and remodeled it in, uh, in FreeCAD. So this is the, the original, and this is the remodeled and um, modified uh, model. Uh, from FreeCAD, I exported this model as STL. Um, and um, the STL. Oh, uh, sorry, yeah. So in FreeCAD, uh, how to model things in FreeCAD. Um, there are uh, a number of different workbenches in FreeCAD. Uh, these are collections of tools designed for doing specific things. Um, there's finite element analysis. Uh, there's uh, technical drawing um, uh, workbenches for producing 2D drawings like you would hand to a machinist. Um, the one that you use for modeling is called the part design workbench. In part design, you, um, the, the sort of the atoms of this universe are two-dimensional drawings called sketches. Sketches consist of lines and arcs and a number of other uh, elements. You build these sketches up on a plane, and when you're happy with a sketch, you can use that sketch to either extrude uh, material to build up uh, a 3D shape for in the, the outline of this 2D sketch, or you can uh, subtract the sketch from your model. Uh, this is called pocketing, padding and pocketing. Um, sketches can be fully dimensioned and constrained, where you specify the relationships between the different lines and, and, and arcs that make up the sketch. Uh, they don't have to be, but it's um, preferable to have your sketches be fully constrained so that you precisely control all the geometry, uh, leaving no, n none of it up to, uh, to FreeCAD. Um, there's a number of other things you can do in FreeCAD that uh, are um, sort of uh, advanced topics. Um, you can design sketches and revolve them as a, as a lathe would do to make um, cylindrically symmetric objects, uh, which are hard to, to design in this sort of push and pull method of, uh, uh, of padding and pocketing with sketches. Um, if anyone is, has used CAD software like um, SolidWorks or Fusion 360, there's a very similar notion in FreeCAD of a feature tree where you draw sketches, you pad the sketches, you draw new sketches, you pocket those sketches, and you build up the part in this sort of sequential way of, of adding and removing material until you have the part you want. The feature tree is very inviting. It, it makes it very easy to, uh, for example, select a face of your part and draw a sketch on that face and then pad or pocket off that sketch. That's a, um, 
a, a common mistake that beginners with FreeCAD make. There is a, a, a deep technical problem in FreeCAD where uh, sketches and surfaces of the model are identified, you, they're, they're given unique identifiers produced by FreeCAD as you pad and pocket. And if you change something earlier in your feature tree and regenerate the part, all of those identifiers change and features built on old planes that have changed identifiers will break and your model will fail to regenerate. So um, if you're doing anything complicated in FreeCAD, uh, you need to employ construction geometry and datum planes uh, and explicitly name and identify the planes where you're going to draw your later sketches. It's an extra step. Um, the FreeCAD developers are working on solving this, but it is not yet a done thing. So if you do a lot of modeling in FreeCAD, watch out for the mm, topological naming problem. Um, another neat feature that FreeCAD has is um, parametric design where you can uh, give symbolic names to dimensions in your part and reference those symbols in the dimensions of other features on your part. So you can have, for example, parametric boxes where you change a single number and it automatically generates um, combing for joints of the uh, edges of the box and, and so on. Um, good stuff. Uh, and uh, there's a number of alternatives if, uh, if, if FreeCAD's quirks uh, are too, too annoying. Uh, SolveSpace is the other main uh, GUI-based free CAD software that I know of. Once you have your model, um, you've exported it out of FreeCAD as an STL, you would then import it into the next layer down in the stack, which is the slicer. Um, Cura is the one that I have the most experience with. It's produced by Ultimaker. Um, it's a open source software, and um, it, it it works quite well. <clears throat> so, to slice a part with Cura, um, you import the STL uh, into Cura and. Uh, it has a bewildering amount of settings that apply to different parts uh, of, of the print. Um, the main settings to worry about is model orientation. Um, this part, uh, when imported, shows up upside down. So it would stand on all these little feet and the space between the, the, the print bed and the sort of main body of the part would need to be supported. So it would use a tremendous amount of superfluous material in order to support the part. Um, supports work pretty well, uh, depending on your printer. Um, but if you can't avoid it, you should. So uh, reorienting the part to minimize uh, support requirements is a, a, a good idea. Um, Cura shows the different um, parts of the G-code that it's planning to emit for you in different colors. Um, the blue parts here are supports. We can see where there is overhang. It inserts a, a little bit of material to support the overhang. Uh, in, this example is a little bit contrived. Most 3D printers can print a little bit of overhang, 10, 20 degrees, depending on the, um, the machine, without needing to be supported because the, a well-tuned printer will free, the plastic will freeze as it exits the nozzle and freeze in place even if it is not fully supported by the layer below. Um, some places like the, the, the tops of these uh, nut pockets or the screw holes obviously have no support from the layer below at all and their um, uh, artificial or additional supports will generally be needed. Um, the, so that's the blue stuff. The red stuff is uh, what Cura calls uh, walls or skin. It's the sort of horizontal edges of the part. Um, the green lines are internal edges that parallel the skin. Um, these add extra rigidity to the part. And then uh, yellow is, um, is, is what's called uh, roofs or floors. There's a, another yellow <laughs> face on the underside that we can't see here. If we scroll down through the layers, um, we can see 
after we get past the yellow part of the, the roof here, we can see the infill, which is a uh, generally low density interior uh, support structure um, that saves on the weight, saves on the material cost of the part, um, while still uh, supplying support to the, um, the, the yellow roof areas here. Um, all of these things are configurable in Cura, and um, depending on the part that you're trying to make, you'll want to tweak these for uh, minimum weight or maximum rigidity or whatever is appropriate for your part. Uh, I don't know all the, the ways to optimize your, your 3D prints, but these are some of the things that are available. Uh, in the slice view here, what we're basically looking at is the G code. Uh, all of these lines uh, correspond directly to lines in the G code output that Cura will emit and that the firmware on the 3D printer will ingest and execute on the machine. Um, there is one gotcha with supports, uh, which is worth mentioning. Uh, if we imagine a V belt pulley like this, and we imagine trying to print it, the upper surface of the V will need support, so Cura will insert supports. And if we scroll down to near the angle of the V, we can see that the supports are contiguous all the way around. So this support cannot be removed from the part. Uh, it's called support locking. Um, here's another example. This is a, a little cage, just a contrived example to show, um, show what I'm talking about. And if we scroll down through this part, we can see the, the sort of bars of the cage locking the support in. So in situations like this, um, depending on your printer, this may be a problem. It may not be a problem. Some printers will print dissolvable supports uh, where you take the part off the printer with a support locked into the part and you drop it into a solvent bath or an ultrasound, ultrasonic cleaner, and the support dissolves away uh, over the course of an hour or two. Um, if your printer doesn't have dissolvable supports, you can try to remove it mechanically uh, through maybe with a file or a chisel or a Dremel tool. But if you can, you can try to design your parts so that they don't uh, aren't subject to, to support locking. For example, you might print this in two separate parts, each of which can be laid with a large face down on the print bed, and then the two can be mated together, maybe with holes and alignment pins and uh, attached with cyanoacrylic glue or something like that. So just to, to make the part easier to print. This is one of the many ways in which uh, design specific uh, or process specific design guidelines come into play. Okay, so that is all I have to say about additive. Subtractive uh, processes tend to be uh, a bit harder. Um, there are more process-specific um, things to keep in mind, things that you didn't have to worry about with additive. The main one is that um, with when you're 3D printing stuff, you have a print bed and you squirt out some plastic on the print bed and there's your part there is no force being applied to the part as you produce it. With subtractive, by the nature of subtractive, you have a cutting tool that's bumping into the part, into the workpiece, as you're uh, removing material that you don't want. Um, in, in subtractive, the first thing you should think about when you're designing a part is how you're going to hold the part as you're cutting it. Um, Oftentimes, this will be in a vise uh, or in a custom-designed um, fixture plate that, that holds the part. Sometimes um, the part will be uh, directly attached to a spoil board, which is a sacrificial piece of material that's easier to hold. Um, after you've figured out work holding, um, you have to figure out um, the coordinate system that you're going to be using, the, the origin of, your, uh, of, of the coordinate system that the G-code will execute in. In 3D printing, this is not an issue because you just, as long as the part fits on the print bed, you don't really care where on the print bed it is. And if you want to print multiple parts in a single print, you can easily just drag stuff around in the slicer until everything fits. In contrast, in subtractive, 
you've got a vise that you've mounted to your milling machine, you've clamped a piece of material in your vise, and if you run the G-code somewhere where there isn't raw material, it's not going to make your part, right? It's going to be driving the tool around in the air next to your part. So the first step is always identifying the location of your, uh, of your raw material. Um, you can do this with uh, an automatic probe that talks to your machine controller, or you can do it with a more manual process where you drive the machine around and use a, a manual um, edge finder to bump into the edges without cutting them and informing the machine controller that uh, this is uh, the, 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 the zero point, if you will, of your, of your coordinate system. So together, work holding and the coordinate system, we call that the setup. You, uh, you do this before you start running the G-code that the CAM software produced for your part. Uh, some parts will need multiple setups. For example, uh, you might need to machine a surface that is not accessible from the top by the tool. So you would perform some number of operations on your part and then stop the machine, flip the part over or somehow rotate it or move it in the work holding system that you've uh, selected. Once you release the part from the machine, your coordinate system becomes unknown and you have to re-zero the work in the machine. Um, another issue that comes up in subtractive that isn't part of additive is how hard your tool cuts into your work. Um, different tools will have different capabilities and different um, uh, amounts of force that they can apply to the workpiece before your tool breaks. Um, higher diameter tools, of course, can uh, apply more force, which is a two-edged sword because it means you need more effective work holding uh, or your part will go flying. Um, and yeah, finally, the last thing I think to, to worry about in, in subtractive is um, Overhang. There are some geometries that are fairly easy to do, uh, part geometries that are easy to accomplish with uh, additive machines that are fairly difficult to accomplish with subtractive machines. Anytime you have overhangs in your part where the direction that the tool will access the part, uh, <laughs> the part blocks access to the stuff that's under it. So if you have a, like a tabletop, you can't come under and machine the underside of the table, you would need to have a second setup where you flip the table over to access the underside. Um, in some situations, depending on the geometry that you want, you can use uh, specialized cutters uh, with specific shapes. Um, uh, for example, T-slot cutters will let you do some, some undercuts of simple geometries, but generally, in the general case, you're looking at multiple setups for that. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, and feeds and speeds. Yeah, that's the, um, the one I skipped over. Um, so we're all, or in additive, one of the parameters that the slicer, that you have to tell the slicer is how quickly to drive the nozzle around the part. Um, the slicer will then figure out how quickly to force r raw material into the hot end of the, of the machine in order to, you know, extrude the right amount of material. Uh, there's an analogous um, setting for uh, subtractive CAM software, which is the feed rate of the tool through the material of the part. If you, um, if you drive the tool too quickly through the material of the part, then each cutting edge of the cutting tool will grab too much of the material and there will be too much force between the the cutter and the work, and you get um, various negative effects from this. For example, you can have uh, tool breakage if things get too bad, or you might have just um, poor uh, surface uh, finish on the part that you're cutting. Um, likewise, if you don't feed fast enough, then you can um, get into a situation where deflection of the tool based on force from the part pushes the tool out of its cut and now the cutting edge rubs against the surface of the material instead of cutting the material. So you get a tremendous amount of uh, wear on your tool, uh, as well as heat buildup in both the tool and the part. Uh, along with the cutting feed, 
um, the rotational speed of the tool itself um, comes into play here. Feeds and speeds are uh, considered together in subtractive. And this is uh, a fairly com a surprisingly complicated uh, uh, problem to solve. As far as I know, there isn't a good open source or free software tool to compute feeds and speeds. So um, in practice, you have to either uh, look at uh, answers from closed source feed and speed calculators. There's some great ones. Um, or you're digging through data sheets from the manufacturer of your cutting tool and uh, looking up the workpiece material and correlating that to the diameter of your cutter and looking up feeds and speeds uh, that way. So that's an area for uh, development in the open source world. So here is an example of some subtractive um, machining. Uh, this was an art project uh, that I did some years ago. This was all done with open source software. Um, the, um, <clears throat> the part uh, that we made was sort of a, this big wooden sculpture designed uh, to, uh, to be burned at the end. Um, it was modeled partially in FreeCAD and partially in Inkscape. Uh, it was, um, uh, the G-code uh, was all generated in PyCam and the part was cut on a large format uh, CNC wood router uh, like the ShopBot at Bitgref, uh, but uh, running Linux CNC. So here is uh, a close-up of one of the parts. Um, the parts, um, the sphere uh, is, it, it was basically a flat pack sphere, like uh, you find children's models with parts that slot together to build up what looks like a, a, a 3D shape. The, um, the large circle there is about two and a half meters in diameter. Um, the horizontal circles uh, are made up of two parts. So these pieces are made up of two parts each. Each one is sort of a half uh, circle uh, with a lap joint uh, where, they, where they overlap, attached by, um, by uh, screws and T-nuts. Um, the vertical parts here uh, are separate half circle pieces. So um, they would slot in uh, uh, into the, uh, the the circular horizontal parts. The size was uh, determined by the largest machine that we had available, which is um, optimized for cutting sheets of plywood. Uh, in the US where I live, sheets of plywood are sold in 1.2 meter by 2.4 meter uh, flats. So um, the largest single part is just barely small enough to fit on a single piece uh, of plywood. Um, the, the sphere itself was modeled in FreeCAD like this, a solid model. Um, you can't really see it, but this is the feature tree that I talked about. So there are three separate sketches that make up this model. There is the outline of the part that unsurprisingly looks uh, about like this. Uh, there are a number of holes uh, modeled into the part. Um, some of these holes are for the part itself to, uh, to attach various kinds of decorations. And some of the holes, like you can see here, which are outside of the part, are for drilling into the plywood so that we could screw the raw material to the table of the machine for work holding. You have to work hold not only the part you care about, but also the waste material. Otherwise, when you finally cut your part free, the cutting forces on the raw material will push the, uh, the, the spoil pieces, the waste pieces away, and that's a really good way to break cutters. Um, and then the third um, sketch is um, the outline of the pocket where the, the lap joint will be. It's this little step here. <clears throat> so uh, after this model was complete, uh, I exported it as SVG. SVG is excellent for 2D models or 2D views of 3D models. Um, I uh, imported 
these SVGs into PyCam. I unfortunately don't have a picture of that. Uh, and um, the production process uh, went as follows. First, the, uh, the holes were all drilled. Uh, the the, the workpiece is now laying on the table of the machine. We mount a drill in the spindle. We drive it around and drill all the holes. Uh, then a human comes in with a screwdriver and puts screws in the, the, these hole locations. Um, having the holes pre-drilled both protects the workpiece and shows you uh, where the, uh, the, the boundary between the piece and the waste material are. So it's, it's very easy to put screws in the work in the, in the workpiece that won't be interfering with the path of the cutter later. So once it's locked down, this is the work holding for this project, uh, we would switch to a, an end mill and um, machine first the pocket where the, um, where the lap joint uh, was going to be, and then uh, cut the part free from, uh, from the waste material. Um, Yeah, so one other thing to mention here. So this screenshot is uh, one of the many Linux CNC GUIs. Um, this is running on the, the ShopBot itself at this point. And uh, this is what the operator sees while cutting, the, while running this G-code on, on the, the, the CNC router. Um, you can see here the arc of the part that we saw in CAD earlier. And we can see here the G-code um, that the machine is executing to produce, uh, to produce this part. The tool is in the middle of one of these arcs, but the G-code is a long sequence of short, straight lines. Um, so this is a result of the CAM software not correctly communicating arc information to the machine controller. The CAM software has tessellated the part, broken it down, into a, a, a sequence of approximations, um, and this is what the machine controller has to work with. Um, Linux CNC does a pretty good job of keeping the speed up on, um, on uh, uh, long lists of short lines like this, um, so it's not terrible, but uh, one area for improvement, I think, in the free software space of CAM software is uh, treating arcs as first-class objects throughout, uh, throughout the process rather than doing early tessellation like this, which is what, what PyCam does. Uh, okay, that's the end of that uh, demo. Any questions on this process or? Well, actually, uh, what, what's, what's Yeah. Uh, so, what's uh, where there lies the problem with having uh, having uh, other uh, 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 what's it called o other uh, uh, primitives than the lines? Um, I am not entirely sure what <coughs> excuse me what led to uh, what led the PyCam developers um, to, to to doing this um, instead of. Um, propagating the, uh, the the arc information from the input. Um, doing geometry on arcs is more difficult mathematically than doing geometry purely on lines. Um, the path that we see here is not the sketch that was drawn in FreeCAD, of course. What we see here, if you look uh, I wish I had this as a live demo, but if you imagine rotating this and looking, the slots here are, have no gap in them. Uh, the tool comes in and then goes out basically on top of the same line because it has been offset by the cutter radius from the input model. We want to leave behind the model that the person drew in CAD uh, since the, this is not a laser cutter, so the, the, the cutting bit has takes up some space. And so one of the jobs of the CAM software is to offset the material contour of the model by the radius of the cutter so that the part left behind by the edge of the cutter uh, 
is the part that the human wanted, not the part that the human wanted minus a cutter radius. So this offsetting operation, um, can, it can be hard to get that right with any primitives, but especially with arcs. And I think a shortcut that cam authors, maybe not you, but other cam authors, take. I, I have, I've, I've been working on uh, 3D uh, <coughs> software a lot. Okay, excellent. Um, but but it's, uh, not on CAD, but it's, uh, it well, yeah, I, I have my ideas. But oh, okay, yeah, yeah, this is, uh, that's wonderful. I'm, I'm really glad to hear it. And, and, and it's an area where I think the, the free CAD community or CAM community uh, could sure use, use some help. Um, th this is, I don't know the full reason why they do it this way, but this is a very common thing that you see in sort of um, uh, less mature CAM packages, shall we say, uh, where the, 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 the model is converted into a simplified approximation very early on in the process, and those simplifying assumptions carry through all the way to the, the end result. Um, yeah, uh, working with arcs in computational geometry is, as you know, doable and not, not, not impossible, but uh, it is definitely more difficult than, 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 than lines, yeah. Mm. Uh, okay, so this concludes this example. Um, <clears throat> another application of CNC, uh, subtractive CNC technology is in uh, circuit board machining. Um, you um, can do this entirely with open source software. Um, it works quite well. Uh, in, this, um, in this case, you start with um, fiberglass boards with copper deposited in a uniform thin layer on either one side or both sides. And um, you, um, you design a circuit in um, KiCad is the one I use. There are some alternatives, but uh, that seems to be the most mature one that I've come across. And then the, um, the circuit schematic is translated into a P uh, PCB design. This won't be a printed circuit board. It'll be a machined circuit board or a, uh, a milled circuit board, but uh, the terminology persists. The, um, the PCB design, uh, you can then import uh, into a CAM package. I used one called FlatCAM that uh, was full of quirks, but really worked pretty wonderfully. Uh, it will um, produce G-code that standard machine controllers like Linux CNC can, uh, can execute. Um, so a, uh, uh, it begins with a schematic, which is a, a very abstract drawing of the circuit you want. Uh, in this case, here is a 50-pin connector and another 50-pin connector. And the pins are mostly connected, one-to-one, -one, two two-to-two, and so on, except some of the pins are pulled out to a separate header. So it's a, a very simple uh, circuit schematic. At this level, you only worry about logical connections between your components. You don't worry about realizing any of this physically. The next step, the PCB design or PCB layout, is where you describe physically how the circuit should be realized. Um, this actually looks a lot cleaner and easier to understand than the, uh, than the schematic. Um, so um, <clears throat> this is a simple single layer circuit. So we're only worrying about uh, machining one side of the, uh, of the copper clad board. Um, each of the green lines, of course, is a trace on the circuit board and it needs to be electrically isolated from all the other traces, all the through holes where the pins of the component are gonna go, and so on. There are design rules that come into play here as well. Uh, the width of the trace determines how much current you can safely run through the trace before it melts. Um, the, PC, the output of the PCB design uh, is a pair of file types, one describing uh, whole diameters and locations this is called an Exelon file for some historical reasons. Maybe there was an old drilling machine called an Exelon, I don't know. Um, and uh, Gerber files, which describe the geometry of the traces in more of a polygonal format. Um, these files are then imported into uh, FlatCam um, and 
Flat Cam is another one of these sort of immature cam, free software cam projects, uh, full of weird quirks that need to be worked around. But um, we can see in blue here the G code that Flat Cam is, uh, is, is producing in order to realize this part. So it goes around the outside of each trace and cuts a, a thin uh, gap between that trace and its neighbors. Each trace becomes an island, right? in a sea separated from all the other islands. Um, and the, um, the red holes here are uh, drilled through holes. Um, normally on high-end equipment, you'll have a great number of drills of different diameters, and the machine will select the drill that's appropriate for the hole that you're making. Um, my machine doesn't have that, so instead uh, FlatCam has this feature called helix milling, where you use an end mill and you interpolate uh, a hole in the same offset way as we were talking about before. And so you can make different diameter holes uh, with, with the end mill that way. Uh, and then, yeah, this runs on uh, the machine controller. Again, this is Linux CNC because it's the only one I know. And we can see the G code that FlatCan gave us. Um, this G code file doesn't include the helix milling of the holes, or we would see little corkscrew spirals where all the holes are. And on the machine, it looks like this. Um, this piece is about yay big, maybe. Um, the end mill uh, is one quarter of a millimeter in diameter, so very fragile, very slow. Um, the workpiece is held to the table of the machine with double sticky tape uh, because the cutting forces are so low. Um, and at the end of the process, you just sort of pry it loose with a spatula. It works pretty well. Any questions on this process? All right, and then my final demo is a um, metalworking project. This is. Um, a fan mount um, for holding a normal 40 millimeter fan over the CPU of a little embedded ARM board. Um, it was a pretty good board, quite capable, but terrible thermal control, and uh, it would over overheat all the time. So um, this part was modeled in SolveSpace, which is the other major um, GUI CAD software in the uh, free software space. Um, this is a fully constrained sketch, like I was talking about for FreeCAD. Same concepts apply in SolveSpace. Um, every location is fully specified. There is no room uh, left to the CAD software um, to, to make a different part than the one that I had in my mind. Um, like all of these open source projects, SolveSpace is full of quirks. In SolveSpace, you cannot export a sketch. So there's no way to get a sketch out of SolveSpace. Um, what I had to do was do the equivalent of a pad operation to make the sketch three-dimensional. And once you have a three-dimensional model in SolveSpace, you can, you can cut a slice to, to generate a view through the interior of the part. And those slices you can export. So uh, exporting a slice through the 3D part gives me back the sketch that is the, the outline of the part that I actually want. Um, this sketch I then imported into PyCam, which is, uh, again, that buggy piece of cam software that I was mentioning earlier. Here um, we can see pretty well, I don't know if this shows up, but the blue outline is the part itself, the SVG exported from SolveSpace, and the red lines are two concentric, two sequential cuts. Um, when you're cutting something hard to cut, like metal, um, if you're cutting a slot, like if you have a, a piece of raw material that you haven't cut into yet and you're going to cut out this complicated shape, um, you'll begin by plunging the cutter into the work and cutting the full width of the cutter through the, the material. This is about the most challenging cut that you can take um, because the amount of engagement between the cutter and the work is the greatest that it, it can be. Um, so. Again, the cutting forces are high and the, um, 
the surface finish suffers as a result because the, the, the cutter is working so hard. So um, it is preferable to do this in two steps. First you do this, this, this slotting cut uh, outside of the finished material contour that you want to leave behind. So you cut a part that's larger than the part you want. You leave a little bit of extra material on the part. And then after the slot is finished, you come back and you make a second cut, a finishing cut, that brings the part down to size. So the outer of these two contours is the first cut, the challenging slotting cut, and it leaves behind an incorrect, uh, an oversized part, and then a second finishing cut comes and follows the final material contour. Um, and um, the holes, you can see, are not represented in red in this picture, so PyCam is not generating any G-code for the holes. This is because the cutter that I had available, uh, my end mill, was larger in diameter than the holes, and so you can't use it to cut the holes. The holes would be oversized. Um, so, embarrassingly, I read the hole locations out of CAD by eye and wrote a separate drilling program. But you got to do what you got to do. Um, and this is the part, uh, fresh off the mill. Uh, again, that's uh, the, the, the Linux CNC view uh, in the background showing the, the, the path. And here the drilling operations do, uh, do show up because this is the second program um, that I ran on this part. Okay, and that uh, concludes my overview. This is a dramatic reenactment. Uh, <clears throat> any questions on any of this? Please. Yes, wonderful. So uh, you're, uh, you're describing this two-step process. Uh, is, uh, is there something that can be done uh, with the feed and speed, for in instance, to, to minimize so that you don't have to do that two-step process? Or, or is it preferable even if you can control the forces more specifically? Yeah, uh, it's, it's preferable in all cases. Um, even if you tune your feeds and speeds perfectly, slotting cuts, slotting cuts are still going to be uh, leave a rougher surface finish than a finishing cut would. Um, it's also people who are serious about their uh, surface finish will use a different tool for the initial roughing out of the part versus the final finishing cut. Um, you can get special uh, roughers, uh, they're called roughing cutters, uh, that are very adept at high material removal rates uh, at the cost of leaving terrible surface finish. So if you have a huge piece of material that you need to quickly hog out uh, to reveal a very small part inside, uh, the two-step process is, uh, is a huge time saver as well as an uh, improvement in quality. That leads me to another question. So, you're working with the both metal and uh, metal and uh, wood. Uh, mm. So, the metal is a fairly homogeneous material, but the wood is not that uh, homogeneous. Yeah. So, I mean, if you uh, touch upon some more porous part, like, how how do you treat the wood, or how, how do you prepare in order to not leave these uh, marks in the wood if you tr uh, happen upon the uh, porous area. Right, yeah, like if you run into a hard knot and then a, a soft, spongy Something part like of the that, wood. Yeah. yeah. Um, there isn't a good way to do it. Um, there, the machine can sense to some, uh, at, at some level, how hard it has to work in order to cut your, uh, your material. And you can imagine um, inserting some smarts into the machine controller maybe to, to throttle the machine up and down depending on how hard it's, it's working to slow it down if it hits a hard spot and, and speed it up maybe if it hits a soft spot. That's generally not done, uh, at least not in the sort of amateur circle where, uh, where I operate. Um, maybe people who are serious about uh, CNC woodworking know something about this that I don't, but uh, we try to find feeds and speeds that work across uh, the full range of conditions that you expect to encounter in the project. Um, there are some tricks that you can do um, to improve specifically wood finish. Um, cutters can be either what we call up cut cutters, where the helix of the cutting edge forces the chips or the, the cutoff material upwards. 
Um, and this imparts a force on the top surface of the part which is not counteracted by anything. There's the boundary between the part and the air and the cutter comes and rips the, 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 the material, the workpiece up and it can leave splinters that sort of get flayed back. Um, in contrast, woodworkers will sometimes choose to use down cut cutters, um, which as the name implies, the, the helix, the winding of the helix of the cutter forces the cut material down towards the table. This has the benefit that you don't get as much tearing out on the top surface of the part, but of course it means that you're compacting your saw sawdust and your wood chips down against the table, so you need a good evacuation of those chips through compressed air or vacuum or some other um, kind of, uh, of technique. Um, sharp cutters is really about the best you can do, um, and you can get pretty good results um, without, without too much difficulty. Uh, again, oftentimes after the CNC machine is finished, the part is not finished. You're taking the part off and you're sanding it by hand or applying some other kind of surface treatment. And that's especially important with, uh, with wood products, of course, where you have, um, where you have those inhomogeneities and the, the kind of tearing and stuff. Those problems are present also on metal metal work, but to a, since, since the, the, the material is more homogeneous, you don't get the same kinds of surface errors. Um, you get some scalloping from the tool. The tool is cylindrical and it's moving and each time a cutting edge comes through you get a little half circle cut into the part and then over a little bit and then another half circle. Um, so it's a, <clears throat> it's a problem that occurs everywhere and it's especially bad with wood. Thank you for the questions. I got questions? Uh, what uh, or how do these uh, CAD uh, free software systems handle threading? If you want to 3D print a thread or mill a thread? Yeah, yeah. Excellent question. Um, in general, uh, in my experience, we do not model the threads. We mark the holes that we intend to be threaded, uh, and um, the, the computation of the thread G code, at least in subtractive processes, is done um, at the CAM layer rather than at the CAD layer. You would have a hole, and you would program a tapping operation at the whole location, just like you would program a drilling operation. That's in, uh, in subtractive. In additive, I believe that I have never seen threads printed into a part. Um, in additive, the resolution that's achievable by the machines that I've had access to at Hackspaces and such is too coarse to adequately produce threads. And even if you could produce them, the material would be too weak to hold the threads. In additive, generally, uh, I could back up to the, the, um, the example that I showed. In additive, um, <coughs> the two processes that I have seen for producing threaded holes are, oops, um, It, the angle isn't perfect, but here you can see a hexagonal hole in the printed part. This is sized so that you can press with your thumbs a nut into the part, and you put the screw through the other side and you screw it into the nut. So the screw comes through here and goes into the nut, and between the, the, the nut and the screw, that's all the threads you get. Um, an alternative way is to produce an oversized hole where you want female threads to be, and then press a heat set threaded insert into the plastic. Um, there's a special tip that you can get for a soldering iron and a special little nut essentially with a female thread inside and a rough knurled surface on the outside. And you, you place the, this insert 
against the hole where you want the threads to be and you press it in with a soldering iron so that the, 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 the insert is metal and it heats up and it melts as you press on it and forces its way into the, 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 the hole and then when you remove the heat, it, the plastic freezes in place and now you have a, a, a threaded metal hole in your plastic part. And then the, the nut is just the, the cheap way of doing that without having to buy the special threaded inserts. Looks like that's it. Okay. Well, thank you for yeah. having me. <laughs>